So here I am at uh, the historic recreated site of Martin Station in Virginia. And uh, I'm going to talk a wee bit of history about, about this uh, fort station it was called, but fort's the same term essentially. Uh, before I get into that, I want you just to have a look in the backdrop at this beautiful topography that I'm looking at right now. So what you're looking at is the um, Appalachian Mountains, or in this area they call them the Cumberland Mountains. And about seven miles to, to my left, or to the west, is the Cumberland Gap. So the history of this particular site begins in 1769. Now the French and Indian Wars are over, and, and I'm going to put out, throw out a, a theory of mine that the, the mountain range that you just saw in the backdrop here is actually one of the causes of the American Revolution. So the French and Indian Wars start, and at that time, American colonists, well, you're all British subjects. You're loyal to the king. Um, and on the frontier, you'll be in your militias or what have you, but you're still loyal to the king, and you're fighting for the nation. So you're fighting the French who are on their stronghold is on the other side of these mountains, and the English colonies, of course, are all up and down the Atlantic seaboard. So the war is fought, and it's a long, bloody war. It's a seven-year war. A lot of these American people that fought in that war thought they were fighting for land. War ends, England wins, and the king in England he decides to put out this edict that says, okay, we won the war, we now own the continent. But that's the dividing line. That piece of rock that you see will be the barrier between Indian nations on the, on the west of it and the American colonies on the right of the wall. Americans were pretty fed up with that. That was, you might look at the French and Indian Wars as the impetus or the start of the American Revolution. So now we're back to 1769. Joseph Martin uh, arrives in what's known as the Powell Valley, where I'm standing. And he erects a, a few crude cabins and a palisade. Uh, the crew company, they plant a crop of corn. And, well, <laughs> they never get to reap the benefits of that corn. They never ate a cob because... Uh, they're constantly attacked by natives and, and the fort's abandoned. So it, uh, we get into 1777 and Joseph Martin arrives back in the Powell Valley, basically to this very same spot and he erects a more permanent place and what you're seeing in the backdrop. And before getting into the rest of the history, I, I've spent a lifetime visiting historic sites and this is one of the most authentic ones I've ever been at. The the entire uh, structure is built with hand tools. Um, they, in fact, even brought the logs in before they hewed them and did all their work with oxen. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can't get more accurate than this. They have dirt floors. There's a couple of block houses. We're going to take a tour in a minute. But so, so Joseph, he's built this fort. He's got a crew of uh, somewhere between 16 and 18 men. We're not quite sure there. And the year 1777. And now this is a... Um, or sorry, 1775. So this is a, a crucial time for in America because we're on the cusp of the American Revolution. Uh, it also t coincides in that very year where the Transylvania Company have signed a deal with the Cherokee Nation that are on the west side of the Appalachian Mountains to purchase 32 million acres of land. That's signed, sealed, and delivered. And along comes this fellow, by, and you might have heard of him, Daniel Boone. And he's leading a company uh, hired by the Transylvania uh, Company to uh, go through the Cumberland Gap, which I mentioned is just to the west. Uh, and it's the only way you're going to get through this range. There is no way you're going to get men, wagons, uh, oxen up these mountains. They're, they're quite steep in this area. So he, he arrives at Martin Station. Now, we know for 10 years prior to, to this station being built permanently, that some hunters, trappers, uh, land speculators had made their way west of these mountains. We know that, but not, not in any great numbers. Uh, but Daniel Boone arrives, and we know that he's certainly not the first to cross them, but he's the one that marks the trail through the Cumberland Gap. Now we get to what's called the Wilderness Road, and leading up to this fort, uh, it's a 200-mile arduous trek to get here. And this is the last fortified position and I sort of have this vision as, as time went on of all these weary travelers arriving at Martin Station and perhaps seeing the smoke coming out of the multiple cabins and smelling the stew pots cooking. So it was a place of refuge. It was a place to resupply. Then it 
actually plays a significant role in, in the American Revolution. And George um, uh, uh, Roger, Rogers Clark, he's making his way north to uh, and ultimately win the sort of the western frontier of the American Revolution. So an amazing site. Uh, I've had a great time down here. There's been some amazing artisans, amazing speakers. I'm going to take you on a tour of the fort. Okay, here we are inside the fort, and the fort has two block houses, one in each uh, alternate corners. Uh, in the bottom of the block houses, we've got uh, living quarters, and in the upper part, we've got the barracks or sleeping quarters. Uh, they're pretty basic. Uh, also included inside the fort are four small cabins. Uh, often they would have a well inside the fort because if uh, it was a siege warfare with natives, they would have to fort up here. Uh, and it wouldn't be uncommon in a time of crisis to have two, three hundred people inside this small stockade living for, for days, weeks at a time. Anyway, let's take a peek inside. So you can see the dirt floors fireplace and how very, very basic it was to live on the frontier in the 1700s. But as I mentioned, it's a, it was a refuge. It was a place to one could feel safe, at least for a short period, before you made the arduous trip across the Cumberland Gap. And we'll take a look up into the upper part portal where the barracks are. So this is a shout out to Bill Hick, who's, uh, well, you might say that Martin Station was his, his brainchild. Um, they approached the, the government, actually got legislation uh, passed that would allow them to build all these structures without a, uh, complying with federal, state, or municipal code. Uh, and you can see by the hand-hewed floors, this was all done the way it was done. Uh, the cedar shakes on the roof, they're all hand-hewn, froed out, uh, the, back to the floor. They're actually held down here by wooden pegs, so there's no nails or screws or such things in, in this structure, just as it would have been built. We can see the morning sun sort of coming through one of the shooting portals, and you'll see in every direction that uh, it would be a very defendable uh, position. So we just had a uh, quite a heavy rainstorm pass through. That was pretty exciting. And uh, this is why they call these the Smoky Mountains. So I'm at the blacksmith shop and I'm with Mike Miller. I finally, finally get to meet you, Mike. It's a uh, pleasure you know, to meet you. Your reputation precedes you. So does yours. Uh, Mike is, uh, an, well, anybody that shoots a black powder gun knows the name Mike Miller. Your, your, uh, your reputation, like I said, does precede you, even up in Canada. Yeah. Good. Yeah, you made it up there. I thought, I'd like to buy one of your guns, but what were you saying I would have to uh, wait now? Four years. Four years. Unless you're left-handed. Yeah, you, you have one for sale. Well. So this is one you made. That's yes. a beautiful weapon, actually. So, um, five years. So y your business has grown substantially yes thinking. yes it has and and that's a good thing double-edged sword or it it is uh, it's been a, a real blessing for sure because I this is what I wanted to do when I retired and it just so happened that I kept hitting the right steps and the right doors and when I retired on a Friday I went to work on Monday and I was building guns perfect and you have a bit of history building you, you were saying yeah growing up yeah um, I, you know, I, like everybody else, we watched Daniel Boone, and I got a kit when I was 12, and I got a barrel and a lock when I was 15, made one from scratch from the Foxfire 5 instruction manual, those books. and wore out two or three of them, volumes of it, trying to make it right. Uh, but then I was lucky enough to, to run into American Pioneer Video, Jim Wright, and he introduced me to different people in the, in the business. He introduced me to Mark Baker, and... Uh, when I was ready, I ended up building a rifle for Mark. I ended up building a rifle for John Curry. And uh, I met an older guy at a, a gun range, local gun range, and he was, he was building muzzle loaders, but not as decorative. 
Mm -hmm. And so he taught me the basics of how to build a gun right. The fine art. Because I was building some junk. That's, that's where I'm at right now. I'm doing a few builds. I'm starting some Lots scratch builds, do. but I, I'm having a lot of fun with it. But uh, yes, I, I need a mentor. You you actually had the mentor. Right? I did. I, I ran right into him, and uh, I worked in, with him for 17 years out of his shop until he died. And his wife apparently wanted somebody around to change light bulbs and uh, air filters and stuff, so she kept me on for two more years. Good. And then I found a, a log cabin in South Central Kentucky, and I moved from Western to Kentucky there. Nice. So when can they start mentoring under you? Just come on down. Yeah? Yeah. I don't doubt you. No. Don't Just doubt come you. on down. I got, a, I got an outhouse, I got a, a, a spare bedroom, we're ready to go. So how many, how many do you build a year? Somewhere between 12, 15, usually. Oh, that's, that's amazing, and given the caliber, the quality. And I learned several of, the, of my makers, or my uh, teachers, um, watching Herschel House and talking to Jim Wright about Herschel House. He was saying that he could build very quickly in a very workmanlike manner. Mm -hmm. And that means that everything is not so precise, it's just done the way they would have done it. Yeah. Uh, Wallace Gussler taught me about workmanlike manner, and then Ron Ehler taught me about workmanlike manner, and then Mark Silver taught me about workmanlike manner. It's a good thing so. to apply because they, we seek that perfection. Yes. And perhaps that's, uh, well, they, they didn't do it then, did they? No. And you learn where you can leave a scratch on something and where you can't leave a scratch on yeah. something. It's got to be perfect or it's not perfect. Well, I'll tell you, if I ever get some time, I'm going to drop in at that shop. Come on. And uh, I appreciate you having this opportunity. No problem. Meet you and... Uh, I might just have to put an order in. Okay. I'll talk to the Lord. We can do that. When we get home. Yeah. yeah, you might need to ask somebody first. Appreciate it. Mate. <laughs> have a good day. Thank you very much. Good ear to me song, and we'll sing it in praise of good brandy, brandy and rum. There's a clear crystal fountain near England doth flow. Give me the punch ladle of fan and the bow. Give me the punch ladle, I'll fathom the This is the bellows back here behind me, and all it's doing is blowing air into that fire to make it hot. Strike while the iron's hot. If I don't if it's not hot when I hit it, it ain't gonna move very far at all. It might break it in two, forty, eleven times, and it's not gonna make what I want it to make. It's kinda like what's easier to cut, warm butter or cold butter? But it's easier to cut warm butter. Yeah. So that's why you strike while the iron's hot. She needs to be a weed to make that. Oh, it's too late in the day to go to work. Yeah. Well, my name is Michael Dragoo. We're at Martin Station, and I am one of the demonstrators. I'm preparing, um, I'm, I'm smoking meat. Uh, right now I've got some beef in here. After a bit I'll have some trout. The whole purpose of this is to smoke it as long as possible. If I were to smoke this for maybe six hours, I'd be good for two or three days on the road. If I smoked it for 24, I would be, uh, I'd, I'd be good indefinitely. But farewell and adieu to you Spanish ladies, farewell and adieu you ladies of Spain, for I received orders to sail for old England, and I hope very shortly to see you again. We'll rant and we'll roar like true bullion sailormen, we'll rant and we'll roar on deck and below, until we sight lizard on the coast of old England, straight up the channel to Portsmouth we'll Go. It brought about 80 pounds of deer skin to the store. It's roughly maybe between 80 and 40 deer, depending on the weight of them. So that's just a what they're bringing back that one day. March 15th of the same year, Friday, five wagons set out for Charleston, loaded with 9,400 pounds of deer skin. It's about right. So the Catawba, known to be particularly nasty terms of booby traps um, and, and, and poison booby traps, they were known as a tribe who would do things like affix bison hooks to the bottom of moccasins. Now, I do not know how they did that. If you do, please 
sing it out because I've looked at this a hundred different ways and uh, I can't figure out how to get these things on the bottom of the shoe. So I'm here at Martin Station and uh, like I mentioned uh, many times, one of the fascinating parts for me is the people I meet. And I got myself Anthony Weinegar here yep. and uh, this guy is a NAVID researcher. I, I listened to his lecture yesterday and it was absolutely fascinating. Um, it was a good presentation. I enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you. It's very, very humbling. Uh, and I appreciate your time and all the time that you've spent on your channel and sharing things with, uh, with the rest of us has been an inspiration. We find it fun. Not a, not a lot of work, at least on my part. Yeah, I'm just doing it anyway. But you have a website as well. Or sorry, a website. Of course you don't. You have a YouTube channel, which is? I do. It's the Deerskin Diary. And uh, sort of along the, the lines of what you know, I picked up from, from you and some others is take some 18th century topics and try our best to, to reproduce them on camera. Um, the methodology, the, the thought process, the research, and then put it out there for folks and hope that, uh, you know, if that one person watches it and it really changes their trajectory or really gets them interested in the topic, then um, I will consider that mission success. Well, I've watched them all in the research you're doing. Uh, yeah. I think for every hour I sleep, you must research. It's pretty <laughs> fascinating. But the content's great. Um, if you like what Kathy and I are we're doing it for the same purpose. We're just trying to pass it forward, give people that opportunity to look at what research we've done. And we try to physically do what we research, like actually hands-on. And, and that's the fun part for us. Um, but um, yeah. Anyway, if you like our content, you're going to love Anthony. Thank you very much. Again, that's very humbling, and uh, I appreciate finally getting to meet you and uh, getting to shake your hand and put the name with the face, and just wanted to also say thank you for everything that you've done for me. I understand that you're having a bison roast for supper. I am, and I've got to run in just a second to get a cooking. It's time. about a four-hour roast. Time to get out of this heat. What time should I be there? Uh, I'm kidding. Four and a half hours. Come on. <laughs> there'll kidding. be plenty. It's been a pleasure. Yes, sir. <laughs> me too. Thank you. Enjoy your day. You too. But imagine being 16 years old and your mother wakes you up about 1.30 in the morning and says this to you. Jonathan, get up. The regulars are coming. Something must be done. Jonathan, get up. The regulars are coming and something must be done to your 16-year-old son. Now, in the 18th century, there was no teenage years. You were a child and then you were a man. You are a child and then you are a woman. So, but 16 is just so tender. So she gets them up, she gets them going. She announces that the British are about a half a mile away. Now, we all have wonderful 2020 uh, vision, right? Uh, we, we look back on the things, but I, I can see how this led to this, and I shouldn't have done that, and I wouldn't have been in this spot, right? Try to imagine yourself being 16, or like Captain Bowman, excuse me, Captain John Parker, suffering from, from consumption, from tuberculosis, and the mightiest army in the world is a half mile down the road.
soldier, soldier, will you marry me with your musket, fife, and drum? How can I marry such a pretty girl as you when I have no pants to put on? Off, Off to the tailor she did go, go just as fast as she could run. run. She, she bought him a pair, the best, best that was there, there, and the soldier put it on. Soldier, soldier, will you marry me with your musket, fife, and drum? How can I marry such a pretty girl as you when I have no boots to put on? Off, Off to the cobbler she, she did go, go just as fast, fast as she could run. run. She, she bought him a pair, pair the best that was there, there, and the soldier put them on. Soldier, soldier, will you marry me with your musket, fife, and drum? How can I marry such a pretty girl as you with a wife and four children at home? <laughs> 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 <laughs>